Good evening. This is your host, Dan Zapatsky, for the program True Murder, the most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them. Rebecca Salcedo had an easy smile, a sexy body, and strong appetites. She wanted the world. Bruce Clayland, she decided, would buy it for her. The shy engineer quickly fell victim to her charms, getting her whatever she wanted, a new car, a boat, a house. But he wasn't Rebecca's only admirer. Even after Rebecca manipulated Bruce into marrying her, hoping to divorce him and take him for everything he had, she occupied herself with a series of lovers, male strippers, women. They all spent time in Rebecca's bed, but when she learned that a divorce would only get her a few pennies, she knew she had to find another way to secure Bruce's fortune. Uh, the book tonight that featured is Honeymoon with a Killer. He loved her. She loved his money. Um, a return guest, uh, Don Laster, my very special guest, uh, Don Lassiter, Honeymoon with a Killer. Welcome back to the program, Don Lassiter. Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be back with you again. Thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. And uh, a great book, by the way, Honeymoon with a Killer. Um, my favorite question, I think, because I always ask it, is, uh, I'm very curious, why did you decide to write about Rebecca Salcedo and this case specifically? Well, it's kind of an interesting cultural story to that that I did not include in the book. But when uh, my collaborator, my co-writer, co-author, and I, Ron Bowers and I were considering this story, I was looking at it and I was wondering, really, what sounded so familiar about it? And suddenly it hit me that it's a, re it's a retelling of the opera Carmen, Bizet's opera. Uh, uh -huh. in that, uh, and I, I, when I was a kid, I saw a, a, a version of that with uh, Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford. So I'm picturing Rita Hayworth as Rebecca. And in, the, in Carmen, uh, this woman is a beautiful, tempestuous, fiery gypsy in Spain who's selling her wares in a, in a town plaza. And she meets an innocent, inexperienced soldier, Don Jose. He falls wow. hopelessly in love, but she's unfaithful with a bullfighter. Their affair wrecks his life and ends in deadly tragedy. Rebecca meets Bruce while selling spices at a swap meet, captures his heart as unfaithful with male strippers. So yeah. their relationship wrecks his life, which ends in deadly tragedy. So this is, this is Carmen, only without the magnificent music, the March of the Toreadors and the beautiful Habanera. Wow, that's what, incredible. That's what got me hooked on it. <laughs> well, it's a great story. It has all these elements, for sure. Um, now, you, you mentioned Ronald E. Bowers. Uh, he's listed on the cover as Don Lasseter, the author, with Ronald E. Bowers. So right. tell us, uh, who, what is his role in the writing of this book? Ron is a 40-year veteran of the Los Angeles County uh, District Attorney's Office, and he is, he's, he's been involved in, every ma you know, in prosecution of every major crime in that 40 years including right. all the ones you've heard about over the years. And so Ron has just a wealth of experience. So we became acquainted several years ago, and Ron just pretty much helps me with research. He writes some of the things, too, as well. <clears throat> One book we, uh, uh, we quoted quite a bit of his writing. Uh, we didn't do that in Honeymoon. Uh, because I wanted to take a little different type of voice on this one. But Ron right. is just a wealth of information for me. Great, great. Now, uh, for our audience, where does this story primarily take place, and in what era, what, what time are we talking about, what years? It, it took place in the, uh, in the um, actually in the mid-80s, mid um, and uh, it, it, right here in Southern California, she, she, uh, Rebecca met Bruce at the old La Mirada Drive-In Theater, which is now a swap meet uh, in Orange County. Right. Now, we're talking about Rebecca Salcedo, and it's an incredible story, her character. Let's start with her history. Where was she raised? What kind of upbringing did she have? Tell us about Rebecca Salcedo. Rebecca is one of the most complex, multifaceted women I, I've ever in, encountered in, in research. Uh, her friends call her beautiful, fun, sexy, outrageous, generous, affectionate, uh, and others saw her as duplicitous, self-centered, greedy, and evil. Uh, uh, Rebecca uh, was born here in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Hispanic uh, immigrants, and her mother was uh, raped uh, and uh, produced the first daughter, Rebecca's older sister, as a result of that rape in Tijuana. 
and then uh, moved up here and uh, uh, was uh, that that man deserted her and she was married again and and that marriage didn't last forever. So Rebecca grew up in pretty much a dysfunctional family with a lot of strain on the household. She and her sisters didn't get along well. Her mother was a uh, uh, a nurse, uh, worked as a nurse, but uh, was hooked on uh, prescription drugs and spent a lot of time in her bedroom while the sisters uh, pretty much ran the house. So it wasn't a happy childhood. And I don't know if we can say use that as the abuse excuse or not, uh, as many right. criminals who say they uh, grew up in, in a poor environment. Now, one thing you haven't talked about is her, her, her okay, say so we have her upbringing, but what did she develop into? What type of character? Uh, she uh, obviously was an attractive woman. You can see that in the cover on the on the book. But what she what did she realize? If she didn't realize too many things, and what did she realize early on, and how did that affect her character development? Well, her her her, her good looks and her her incredible body uh, it became her uh, her path to uh, existence, uh, to wealth. Uh, she learned soon at the age of about twelve or thirteen, when she grew into a woman's body, that uh, men would give her just about anything she wanted if she behaved in certain ways, and she did. And she had she had no trouble at all displaying those uh, wares. But she also uh, uh, developed a, a gregarious personality that that attracted not only men but women. And I mean men and women in, in any way you want to imagine. Um, she saw uh, that she could uh, get just about anything she wanted. One one man even let her drive a Lamborghini that he owned, and, and, right. and no one knows what she was doing for that. Uh, she learned really early to use uh, her her female wiles and her figure to get what she wanted. She was, by the way, she was once married, but only to provide an immigrant with a green card, and she treated that that marriage as no more important than a yard sale transaction. Right, right. And she also, at an early age, looked much much older than her age as well, which she did, you know, which helped or or didn't help in a particular case. And so what was she doing, say, uh, after her teenage life? At what age uh, would we find her previous to, and we'll get into right away, uh, talking about the main, one of the other characters, Bruce Clayland. But let's, let's talk about, say, her at 20 years old. Where was she at in her life? What was she doing? What was her occupation? Was she going to school? Tell us what she was actually doing at that time. Well, let's back up a little further. She had, at about 13 or 14, she was going to uh, uh, a school, a makeup school, to, to, so she could uh, because she didn't do well at, at that year in school, and that's where she met her best friend. Uh, uh, it looks like Bertha when you read it, but it's pronounced Bertha, and okay. Bertha is a prominent character in our book here. Uh, right. Uh, th- then, uh, as they grew into friends, you know, they became friends, and then uh, uh, Rebecca was very involved with a lot of men and. And she produced a, a young boy, a, a son, and, uh, and she didn't know who the father was exactly. And uh, she found out while she was in jail, and, well, actually in prison for a, 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 a drug uh, conviction. And she she contacted her friend Bertha. I'm going to call her Bertha. I, I, my, I'm not going to try that better to the whole way. Okay. Um, um, so Bertha, she contacted Bertha. Said, "Could you send me some pictures of the men I've been uh, dating? So I'll try to kind of figure out which one is the father." Uh, well, so that gives you a pretty a pretty uh, capsulized picture of what Rebecca really was. Right. Uh, now you you talk about this Bertha. This is she's important to the story because she's with her at an early age, and this is conceivably the very best friend, the person that knows her the best, and we'll say. Uh, her very, very closest friend. So that's why she's very important of all to this story, isn't she? Exactly, that's correct. Bertha was, uh, but Bertha was extremely intelligent, bright, articulate, uh, also a, a, a Hispanic heritage, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, she had a level head, and, that, and that's what Bertha said she, uh, she felt like uh, was attractive to Rebecca, that uh, she sort of kept her on the straight and narrow as much as she could. Now, what was the relationship with uh uh, Rebecca and her other sisters. Uh, you, Dolores, one of her sisters, is a, a primary figure in this story as well. Tell us a little bit about the relationship with her uh, other siblings. Well, it was a terribly fractious relationship, and uh, Ber- Bertha ex- explained to me that the girls were just constantly g- each other's throats. <clears throat> they uh, slept with each other's boyfriends just to make the other one jealous. Uh, they were in constant competition with one another. Uh, no peace, no serenity in that household at all, just warfare. 
Wow. And uh, so, again, now that we've caught up a little bit as time goes on, what is her goals in life? And as you say, she easily can manipulate men to get whatever she wants. What is her goals in life? What is, what is her occupation? What, what does she um, believe she wants to do with her life? Well, I don't think she ever had any real goals. Uh, she was a day-to-day existence. She had a few minor jobs, and Bertha got her a few jobs. One of them was at a, a company where Bertha was uh, doing uh, white-collar work, and she got Rebecca a job as uh, some helper. Uh, but Rebecca thought she would use her her uh, lovely uh, figure to uh, en- enchant the boss, stepped out of a, a, a restroom with her blouse open, and as Bertha explained, everything popped out. Okay. The boss was just absolutely furious and said, get her out of here, and she got fired from that one. So I don't think she had many goals as far as uh, profession. Uh, when she met Bruce, she was working at a company that made uh, spices and, and bottled them in, in interesting rectangular-shaped jars. And uh, Rebecca managed to uh, smuggle a few of those from her employer and take them to that swap meet and uh, sell them there for a little extra profit, and that's where she met Bruce. So she was hustling at that point. Right. Now, tell us, tell us about uh, Bruce Clayland. Um, you call the chapter, and I don't know if this is your idea, but I, I would think it might be that the evolution of a male virgin, and uh, you can tell me why you, you titled it that. But what was his background? What was his family life of Bruce Clayland? Bruce grew up in a, uh, an upper-middle-class home in South Pasadena. Uh, it's just very nice, down-to-earth, salt-of-the-earth uh, people with a fair amount of wealth. One, one sister, one older sister. And, uh, but Bruce, unfortunately, didn't have, uh, he wasn't born with uh, good looks. Um, I pointed out that if anyone remembers the uh, funny character in the old Laughing series called Tiny Tim. Yeah, right. Yes, Tiny Tim. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, poor Bruce in high school, excuse me, <clears throat> bore a, a, quite a resemblance to Tiny Tim. Oh, it, it made him extremely self-conscious about his looks. So he he just w- he became afraid to approach girls at all. They they pretty much shunned him, ignored him, laughed at him. So he concentrated on academics. He was a very very bright kid. Uh, straight A's belonged as a uh, was a four year member of the uh, uh, the uh, group of the kids who uh, achieve all the high grades. He got a scholarship uh, to, to college and uh, eventually graduated with a master's, uh, master's degree from uh, Stanford University in, um, in uh, s- computer software engineering. Right. right. Now, uh, you say, again, you say the, the evolution of a male virgin. You're saying he's shy. Now he goes to college. I guess his life changes. He, does, does he... Does he outgrow any of this uh, sort of nerdy looks? or does, How does his life continue? Well, actually, he did evolve to a fairly decent-looking man, but I don't think he understood that. And by the time he reached age 42, when he met, uh, when he met Rebecca, he still was, um, hadn't had any experience with women at all. Uh, wow. He became extremely frugal during, the, during those years, uh, working up in uh, Silicon Valley uh, for uh, computer firms and uh, on uh, doing international work, actually, undercover work uh, across the various continents uh, for the government. Um, uh, But Bruce became extremely frugal, uh, invested all of his money, and had accrued quite a bit of wealth uh, by the time he was 42. His best pal was his father, and his father and he went to uh, ball games together and and, and did other things together, including uh, driving from South Pasadena, Pasadena a few times to visit the uh, swap meet down in Orange County. Now, he even lived with his parents still at that age, didn't he? That's correct. Well, no, no not at that age. He he uh, had moved uh, to, up to Silicon Valley and then uh, had a place in Hermosa Beach down by the beach here. And that's amazing, too, because any any... Any man who can't meet a woman in Hermosa Beach is not doing very well for himself. He's not trying too hard, anyway. Yeah. No. Okay. So, so he accumulates an incredible wealth. You say he's he's likely a virgin. He has no virtually no experience with any women at all. Definitely. And and uh, how uh, describe the day that Bruce Clayland meets uh, again? He's with his father that day, isn't he? And tell us about the meeting and what exactly happened and how. It all came to be that they, these two people would meet. Well, 
Well, Bruce and his father are strolling along, along in this colorful uh, swap meet, which uh, just uh, every, every kind of vendor in there at all, I think I said from from tortillas to tires uh, right. in there, uh, colorful Mexican flags, music uh, uh, playing in the background. A very, very interesting place to visit. Ron and I went over and strolled through there just to see what the ambiance of it was. Bruce and his father are strolling along, and he spots this rather attractive, voluptuous woman selling spices from from um, interesting jars, and something struck Bruce hard, just something like, I guess, Cupid shot him with an arrow at that point. Right. Uh, he, he told his father and surprised his father immensely by saying, I'm, I'm going to go back and talk to that girl. His father was gobsmacked and just stood <laughs> and looked at with big eyes, and Bruce actually went back and started a conversation with uh, Rebecca, and she saw dollar signs. Sure. And uh, so <clears throat> they, they talked for a while, and it later turned out that uh, she was uh, t- uh, trying to find out as much as she could about him because in the company where she worked, she had access to credit records. And <laughs> when she told some of her friends the next day, I've met the man I'm going to marry, and uh, let me show you something, they thought she was going to show a picture. Instead, right. she pulls out his credit report. <laughs> wow, wow. What did she... Uh... Well, before I go that, what did what did Bruce's family think of Rebecca, and or just the idea that he met this woman? What did he say to his father? Did he did he say, "Listen, I got her number," or we, we, "I've set up a date"? What was what was that conversation with his father about that meeting with Rebecca? I, I don't think they had much of a conversation, but his father was uh, you know absolutely amazed and rather pleased to see his son uh, sure. uh, flirting, uh, trying to set up a date with a woman, and even though they. The father strongly suspected that Rebecca wasn't exactly the uh, type of woman he would like to see his son uh, get involved with. Uh, he still was pleased that something was happening. So they were, and when he went home and told his wife, uh, uh, Bruce's mother, uh, they were pretty pleased to see something uh, with some possible future for their son. Now, you you talked about her going to her co-workers and showing the credit report as opposed to showing a photo of, of the man. So she said this is the man she's going to marry. Uh, other than those people at work, did she have a conversation with her sister about Bruce or about with Bertha or Bertha? Did she have conversations with them immediately after meeting Bruce? Both, yeah, her sister and, and Bertha. And she said, this is the man I'm going to marry. But she also added, I'm going to take him for everything he's worth. And I'm going to be set for life. And uh, that that showed pretty much uh, the type of woman she was. This was not a uh, sudden falling in love by her. If, if, if Bruce was in love, uh, that was one thing. She was not in love. She was in in uh, greed. Now, what did her friend Bertha say, and what did her sister say in response to... I mean, obviously she's manipulated men for all kinds of things, but to have that kind of... I'm going to take every everything he's everything that he's worth, and also I'm going to marry this man. What what was Dolores's response, her sister, and what was Bertha's response to that? Well, both of them were pretty skeptical uh, and and pretty uh, rather appalled. Uh, they thought, well, that's a that's not a very good way to approach this idea of uh, meeting a man. You only want his money, and uh, but. Uh, Rebecca was pretty persistent and said, "That's that's what I'm after, and that's what I want, and I want to be set for life, and I'll marry him, and uh, and he'll get me anything I want." And as it, as it turned out, uh, I told you that uh, Bruce was quite a frugal character. Right. A miracle happened. He he made a complete about face, a 180 degree turn, uh, and started buying her things, being extremely generous with her. She lived in a small, very small house in a in a rough neighborhood. And uh, he went in and bought new furniture for her and her little boy. Uh, she wanted a hot tub. He bought that for her. Uh, he bought her a boat and a trailer to go with it. And, and he stunned. He stunned his parents and his uh, sister, who was married by then, and, and his brother-in-law. And this was his whole circle of uh, social circle was were his parents and his uh, sister and her brother-in-law. And they were just absolutely amazed at what happened to him. And while they were skeptical about <laughs> about it, they they still felt good that he was changing and that might, he might have a, a woman in his life. So, this, despite their, they, he had enough money, he certainly could do whatever he wanted. They, they overall, it looked like 
uh, Bruce was enjoying himself. That he, he wasn't the happiest go lucky guy in the whole world, despite all of his financial success and business success. That's they right. saw a real change in him as a result of meeting Rebecca, and they were they were good with that because of that. Yeah, Isn't that correct? Good with that. And they said, uh, you know, and and uh, I heard that later he, he reports that he was just he was an absolute heaven. He was his his personality changed as well. He was happy and, and uh, whistling and singing and looking forward to every moment he could be with Rebecca. And that's what makes it so damn tragic, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what did Rebecca manage to convince Bruce to do in a short period of time? You talked about the boat, and I wanted to make sure the audience realizes, too, that these weren't exactly ideas that Bruce came up with about the boat. This was from the prodding of Rebecca. I need this, I need this, I expect this. And, and at the same time, we've got to... Bear in mind that she did tell Bruce, uh, drew some lines on terms of his idea of, of uh, well, not romance, but maybe you can tell the audience what her rules were and what she expected and what she told him in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of her uh, moral code. Well, that's a, that's seems a very be. good point you, you make, a very good question. <clears throat> she had, obviously, as I've mentioned, she'd been very promiscuous before this. But sure. in her this facade she's putting on for Bruce, she claims, well, women of my uh, Hispanic origin don't just go to bed with anyone. Uh, they, we, and, and she said, I have one boy, and that's the only uh, man I've ever been with, my little boy's father. And right. so obviously we're not going to have any intimate relations until we're married. And uh, she kept driving that home. I, you know, we, we must get married before... Uh, and um, so that that's just uh, we don't we do not do anything naughty together. And Bruce bought it every inch of the way. Where most men with any experience would have said, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is this is not working here. This is not right." And there was other things too as well that he also made duplicates of his credit cards so she could use them basically at her whim. She also began. Uh, of course, you mentioned that she's very generous. She's very generous with Bruce's credit cards to people, uh, her entourage, we'll say, people in her family or people around her. Um, that was something that, uh, again, another reasonable person might might wonder. And there was, Wasn't there also a stipulation that he really couldn't just pop over to her place at any time? Or was that later when, when, when he actually bought the house for her? Well, that's correct. He, he, he wasn't. He didn't even try to spend the nights with her at that point because he bought her story that she was uh, very uh, moral and wasn't going to allow any hanky paint going on. Right. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, they began to talk about marriage, and uh, and uh, he decided she, she, she he went to take her house shopping, and they bought a be- he bought a beautiful home for her in Whittier on a hilltop, magnificent home, and he right. bought that for her, and. Uh, then she started angling. Of it. She wanted uh, to get her her hooks into the fifty percent ownership of that thing. So she said, "Well, you know, we must be married in a church, of course, because she's a uh, religion demanded a marriage in a church." Sure. But he, she wanted to be. Uh, she said, "If we can just, you know, maybe just go ahead and we should have a civil ceremony first before the church." And he fell right for that and thinking, "Oh boy, now we can move in the house together." <laughs> but even <laughs> after after the little uh, civil service. Uh, yeah. Uh, marriage, she moved into the house, but he wasn't allowed to. He still had to stay down with his parents in South Pasadena. Oh. <laughs> and, and poor guy, you know. If most men read. If most men reading this would say, "Wow, what a fool!" <laughs> there was poor Bruce. You know, he had no experience with this, and so <laughs> the poor guy was just gullible and and love struck. And uh, I've, I've written before uh, in other books. Uh, it's funny what love can do to people. <laughs> sure. At this time, uh, you had just alluded to the brother-in-law, Ed Brown, and and uh, Theta and Harold uh, Clayland. When it got to the point further along, and they were talking about marriage, and, and he bought the house for her, and he wasn't allowed to be over there, was there any suspicion from and anything expressed with Bruce's parents or the the brother-in-law, Ed Brown? Was there any anybody from his side of the family that said, listen, uh, this could be very bad. Well, two things happened. One, uh, his brother-in-law, uh, who, who understood what was going on here, d- did try to uh, talk to Bruce and tell him, you know, maybe you want to be cautious about this before you, you know, plod forward with this woman. Also, one of uh, Rebecca's sisters actually called uh, Bruce's uh, mother, Theda, and said, uh, you know, you, you, you're my sister is trying to take your son. 
uh, for a lot of money, and, and she's not being very honest with him. Uh, and, and this is this shows the uh, the relationship between the sisters that her own sis would do that. Uh, right. But uh, Bruce would have, was having was having none of that. Uh, so uh, and the mother didn't even try to stop him. She thought, well, you know, it's, she, he's a grown man; he should be able to make his own choice. Oh, by the way, let me back up just a little bit. You mentioned the credit cards. Uh, yes, she was buying a lot of things, not just for herself with his credit cards, but for her friends, including a male stripper that she'd been seeing some time before that. And uh, she was, uh, and when she moved into the new house, the male stripper uh, paid quite a few visits there too. And uh, Bruce even even saw him there one time, and Rebecca casually explained, oh, this is just one of my cousins. He just came to visit me a little while. And poor Bruce even bought into that. So, uh, so some readers are going to begin to wonder, what is the matter with this man? <laughs> but yeah, he, right. was, he, was, uh, he was gullible. He was uh, into everything she was doing. Now, wedding plans have, uh, have, been, uh, have been made, correct? And, and at a bridal show, Rebecca meets a photographer that becomes a very important figure in this story, too, named Elizabeth Lamb. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those wedding plans and uh, and about Elizabeth Lamb, too. You bet. Um, uh, in, in the book, uh, readers will see I call uh, Beth Lamb Elizabeth because that's her real name. And writers sometimes, let me explain a little problem that writers have sometimes. Uh, it's interesting because uh, we, I have, it was really a struggle here. I had Beth, I had Bertha, and I had Becky. Uh, Becky is uh, Rebecca's middle name, or, 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 or given or, or nickname, I should say. And so uh, I had to make a, a be, be very, very careful so that I didn't confuse readers. So I called sure. uh, Beth Lamb Elizabeth all the way through, and sure. uh, Bertha by Bertha, and then I refer to Rebecca all the way through as uh, not Becky, so I don't confuse the readers. <laughs> I thought sure. that was kind of that was a real problem for me. Anyway, yeah. Beth was a successful wedding photographer. She was a very cordial humorous, lovely person. And when Rebecca contacted her, um, at first uh, Beth was a little skeptical because she went to the little house in the rough neighborhood and was wondering, well, do I really want to get into this? But uh, uh, Rebecca really wanted the first-class treatment all the way. She ordered the most expensive package that uh, the photographer had available. So uh, Beth said, well, okay, I'll go along with it. Uh, Rebecca, though, wanted to treat uh, Beth like an intimate friend, uh, uh, you know, like she really were very close to her. Right. Beth preferred to keep it on a courteous, professional level. Uh, here I'll give an example of how that worked. Rebecca hosted a wild bachelorette party before the, the Catholic wedding, and uh, I asked, uh, when I was interviewing Beth, I said, did you attend? And she looked at me and she rolled her eyes. She said, not this Mormon mom. Right, <laughs> so right. That gives you a little uh, insight into what uh, Beth was like. And it, uh, no, and so, yeah, she, she, and she, so she went to, they, they had the Catholic wedding at a very, very nice uh, um, Catholic church. Uh, they had a, a magnificent uh, uh, reception uh, later at a uh, country club uh, that because of uh, Bruce's parents uh, had the contacts up in the wealthy section of uh, San Marino area and uh, uh, it's interesting the uh, the wedding was attended by uh, several of uh, of uh, Rebecca's uh, relatives and friends and <clears throat> and, and uh, people she knew but they didn't go to the reception because they didn't quite feel it in, in in the country club atmosphere wasn't theirs. So right. the reception was pretty much attended by uh, uh, the Cleland family and their, right. their acquaintances. Now tell us, uh, you, you, you talked about the bachelor party, and the bachelor party is very important because, like you say, Elizabeth Lamb said, I'm not going to show up, and he says. But it also was because what uh, of some of the information that Rebecca told Elizabeth Lamb, well, this is what's going to go on at this bachelor party, and it seemed uh, way too raunchy for Elizabeth Lamb. But tell us about the bachelor party and who she, who was there to to witness what actually happened at that at that bachelor party. 
Well, the, the bachelor party, as I said, was held at the new home that uh, Bruce bought for her, but, of course, he wasn't going to be there. Uh, she invited all, I think, about 25 of her female friends, but uh, when she told Beth Lamb what the entertainment was going to be, that uh, certainly convinced the Mormon mom she wasn't going to go because she was going to have male strippers as well, including sure. the one uh, who she, with whom she'd been having an affair. And, uh, and uh, the other women didn't mind, uh, although Bertha, her best friend Bertha, did go, but she said, I left before the male strippers uh, because by that time I was involved uh, in, a, in a serious relationship and I didn't want to be there for these male strippers. But she said, I went in to say, go, say be, uh, goodbye to uh, uh, Rebecca before I left, and uh, I couldn't find her. I went into the bedroom, and there she was in bed with uh, one of the male strippers. <laughs> sure. Probably innocent, though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course. They were just uh, getting warm. <laughs> Now, uh, you say there was uh, that, that Bertha left. Who witnessed the thing? Who, who of anyone witnessed the entire thing to, to say what happened the next day? Did anyone stay the night? Tell us about that. Quite a few of the women stayed the night because there was a free flow of much, much drink and much food. And But one of the sisters also saw the, uh, the uh, event between the, uh, between the male stripper and, and her sister, and she kept that in her little... Uh, uh, memory bank to uh, use in the future if she needed to. Right. Now, the wedding takes place, and and, and tell us about the wedding. Is it uh, uneventful? Basically, you say that the reception uh, is basically uh, attended by the, the Clayland's family and friends rather than her family. So tell us a little about the wedding, if there was anything unusual, untoward there, or uh, and, and just tell us about the reception if, and what happened at, at the reception itself. Well, the, the, at the wedding in the church, uh, uh, the, the uh, wedding photographer, Beth, uh, <laughs> she said it was, it was beautiful and, and uh, everything was going well, but she, uh, this introduces one other character that we need to know about. Uh, sure. Uh, Rebecca's uncle, Arturo. Uh, was there now? Uncle Arturo had a uh, he had two sons, uh, Re- uh, Rebecca's cousins, uh, Alvaro and and uh, Jose, and uh, uh, Alvaro was there, but uh, not Jose. But uh, Uncle Arturo, who was uh, a woman groper, <laughs> every time he had a couple of drinks, he, he and uh, Bertha complained many times that every time I'd be around him, he'd try to grapple me, and and she so I told him. I told uh, Rebecca, if he ever touches me like that again, I'm going to kick him where it hurts the most and tell him to keep right. his hands off of me. Rebecca right. said, oh, don't worry about it. He does that all to me to me all the time, too. He's just kidding around. He's just a funny guy. And uh, the uh, Mormon mom wedding photographer was there taking pictures, and she said, that my biggest problem was Uncle Arturo was all over me, trying to grope me, too. Right, and I finally right. told him, get your hands off and stay away from me. And then she took a, she took the pictures, and then, uh, but the the uh, the, um, the uh, reception uh, in the country club was pretty uneventful. Uh, it it went off pretty well, and then uh, the two went off on their honeymoon to Hawaii. Now, do you want me to go ahead and? <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us about the honeymoon because it gets uh, better. <laughs> okay, so they're on their honeymoon in Hawaii, and Beth Lamb is at home, and her phone rings, and uh, and, and she says. And she says, uh, hello, and, and it's it's uh, Rebecca on her honeymoon. She says, oh, my God, oh, my God, Beth, you can't believe it. This is horrible. And she's telling how poor Bruce is totally incapable of doing what he's supposed to do. He doesn't know how. He doesn't know anything about how to please a woman or what to do with a woman. And, oh, my God, she's, this woman is calling this Mormon mom wedding photographer to complain about her honeymoon. <laughs> and, Incredible. And, 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 and she, uh, Rebecca told several other people, she told her own sister. She even, when she got back, she even called Ed Brown, the brother-in-law, with whom she had never had a one-on-one conversation, and was complaining about uh, Bruce's uh, incapable performance. And Ed Brown, the brother-in-law, told her, "Look, what are you doing, telling me this garbage? I, do you you need to talk to someone else? This is not my business, for heaven's sake!" And it stunned him that this woman was spreading these kind of malicious comments about her poor uh, new husband. Right, and what what happened after they got back to the to the states after this honeymoon? How did Rebecca proceed with Bruce? What what what, what was her compl- we know what her complaint was about the honeymoon, but how did she proceed from there? What what happened between the two? 
Well, when she got back, they moved. They did move into the house for a while, and poor Bruce is trying to do his best, but he's beginning to think, you know, oh my God, this, you know, this is awful. I wonder what's going on. And uh, uh, Rebecca is really cold to him. She's spreading these nasty rumors, and then she begins to say, "I, I want a divorce. This isn't working out. I want a divorce." And uh, Bruce is brokenhearted. And within just a few weeks, she kicks him out, and uh, he moves back down with his parents, just stunned and horrified that this woman uh, doesn't want him. Uh, meanwhile, she's having parties up there and inviting her, her male friends. Her stripper friend is coming out and spending nights now, and poor Bruce doesn't know what to do. And uh, and so uh, he finally, uh, at Ed Brown, his brother-in-law's uh, advice, uh, sees a lawyer to talk about it. And the lawyer gives uh, Bruce some pretty good mo- uh, news. He says, you know, uh, the divorce laws, uh, she won't get very much from you because you acquired all that before you were married to her. And the divorce right. laws don't require you to split that with her. And so she'll she'll pick up maybe three or $4,000. Well, when Rebecca hears this, she changes her tone entirely. She, uh, she suddenly doesn't want this divorce. But she begins a new strategy. She begins spreading the word among everyone who will listen for five minutes that uh, Bruce has been molesting her little boy sexually. And wow. now everyone who knows him is, is, is just horrified, including uh, Bertha. Bertha at first said, are you, are you kidding me? Are you, are you telling me that he was actually molesting him? And she tries to rationalize. Maybe he was just holding him on his lap or something and doesn't know how to treat little boys. No, no, I saw him, and he complained. My little boy complained that he molested him. And Bertha realizes this is just a scam. All she's doing now is angling to get his money uh, is via another route than divorce. And did she tell anybody else the molestation accusation as well? She told uh, the wedding photographer also, uh, right. Beth, and, and she told everyone who would listen, including her sisters. And, and uh, the sister didn't believe it. She just called her an outright liar. Uh, but uh, uh, Rebecca wanted to proceed with this. Did this uh, molestation accusation get back to his family as well? I don't know if it ever got to his parents. I I, I hope not because uh, mm-hmm. they, they that would have devastated them. But right. uh, uh, Bertha asked, well, you know, have you called the police? You know, uh, have you called anyone? You just you right. need counseling. You need police help on this. Oh no no no! I don't want to do that because that was that wouldn't work. My uh, but uh, then she came up with an additional accusation. <laughs> Uh, that Uncle Arturo had been visiting and that Bruce had, had uh, propositioned him for a right. you know, sort of a homosexual act. And that uh, now Bertha, uh, Rebecca is spreading the word that uh, now there may be retribution. You know, my, my uncle, in a Hispanic family, you do not make that kind of a proposition to men. Uh, he, I'm afraid my cousins might do something to him. So, so she, was already, she was already laying some groundwork in, in in retrospect, when people think about it, she was laying some groundwork for any kind of uh, sympathy for Bruce to be gone and also laying the groundwork for possibly any kind of uh, talk of assault as well, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah she's laying groundwork, and this is what she's, that's what she's heading for. Now, when she realizes she can't make any money from this divorce, how does she proceed with Bruce? What does she do? Is she still on a spending spree? Does he still does he cancel any credit cards? What? How does he proceed? How does she proceed? And what time frame are we talking about after he's booted out of the house? Well, it's just a few weeks after he's booted out of the house now, and she is she's still using the credit cards extravagantly. Uh, and uh, uh, her stripper boyfriend is having a tough time making meeting uh, things uh, his ex- meeting his expenses, so she's uh, feeding him money as well out of Bruce's uh, uh, accounts. And uh, this is when Bertha becomes uh, more estranged, finally, from uh, Rebecca. You know, this, this is just unfair, because she liked Bruce, and she didn't believe any of the stories about him. But uh, she told him, you stop. You, know, you should stop that. That's not very good. Well, how am I going to live? And uh, so uh, she's, she's spending it rapidly. Now, uh, finally, uh, Ed Brown uh, c- counsels Bruce and says, look, you've know, you got to stop that spending uh, spree. And so uh, finally, uh, Bruce... Uh, it, kills some of the credit cards, so she can't keep doing that to him. Right, right. Now, I guess, to Bruce's surprise, he gets a call from Rebecca. Does Rebecca give him a call about talking about their future? Uh, when does this happen, and who makes the call, and, and what's Bruce's reaction? 
uh, reverses it. He's, and he's folks one, and he's just working every day, coming home and going into his bedroom every night, just mourning right. and feeling awful. And he gets a call one night, and it's Rebecca, and she says, you know, maybe we should make up. Maybe we should get back together. Uh, it would be really nice. Let's. Get, and they had often eaten at a, a, a Mexican food restaurant in Boyle Heights, um, and uh, which is East Los Angeles. And uh, so how about a date? How about we go there and have a couple of drinks and a nice Mexican dinner and let's uh, uh, let's uh, get, get, get get back together. We can repair our marriage. Oh, Bruce is absolutely elated. He just, uh, oh, he's so thrilled and happy. And he tells his mom and dad, and they're dubious, but they say, well, okay, maybe that's for the best. So they take off for uh, to go somewhere one night, and, and Rebecca shows up. I, I, I don't think I mentioned earlier that she, uh, Bruce also bought her a new... Uh, uh, SUV, right. And, uh, um, so she shows up in the SUV, and Bruce gets in. He's the passenger, and she they drive to uh, to, uh, to Boyle Heights and go to their me- Mexican food restaurant. And uh, Rebecca, uh, during the meal, gets up uh, two or three times. First, she goes back, and and, this, and the waitress spots her making a a call from the payphone. And then, uh, just, but that lasts only briefly. And then uh, spots her two other times uh, in, hiding down a hallway making cell phone calls. And then uh, right. they leave the restaurant. Now she thinks uh, that they, she had also they had also visited someone else uh, that evening, which was uh, again in retrospect kind of unusual, or at least it uh, they find out about it and they, they investigate this. This meeting. Who did they go and spend some time with that that evening? That seemed a little unusual to police later. Uh, they uh, they it actually happened uh, after the restaurant. They left the restaurant and uh, okay. drove over to Uncle Arturo's little shambles shambles of a house where he had raised uh, Alvaro and uh, and Jose and uh, three three daughters as well. His wife, by the way, had left him years earlier and lived in another county because of his groping of other women. Yeah. And, uh, so they go to Uncle Arturo's house, and his uh, Uncle Arturo's there with his girlfriend. And Bruce and Rebecca have, uh, they bring him actually food from the restaurant, too. Oh, nice. and, uh, and then they have several more drinks. They've had a few at the restaurant, and they have a few more. And poor Bruce, by this time, is pretty well snuckered. He's, uh, he's had more than he can handle, and he's weaving around. And... They spend, uh, uh, they stay at uh, Uncle Alvaro's house until oh, pretty close to one o'clock in the morning, mm. and then uh, they say, "Well, we've got to get on home back up to Whittier." So they drive out, and uh, she takes a little different route than she normally takes to go to Whittier. Right, and then what happens? Something well, with the vehicle. Um, yeah, by the way, I don't think I mentioned earlier that uh, Alvaro, her cousin Alvaro, also became a male stripper. Uh, in in uh, being up at the house often uh, after Bruce was kicked out, he pretty much moved in too up at the house, and uh, he became a male stripper, uh, a, a client of her of uh, Rebecca's uh, uh, lover, and uh, so now the uh, he's involved. But uh, now, okay, now Rebecca and Bruce drive out in the SUV, and she takes a little alternate route and makes a, a right turn into a residential section. And Rebecca uh, says, oh, my gosh, she, she says, the red light's on the dashboard. That means the back hatch is open. She pulls over into this dark uh, <clears throat> dark uh, residential street and uh, and steps outside to uh, allegedly to close that, and all of a sudden a gunman steps out from the uh, uh, dark bushes uh, beside them and that's you know after 1 a.m. and opens fire he shoots he shoots Bruce and the uh, and one bullet pierces his mouth his cheek and goes out one side but it, it, that's not a lethal shot and poor Bruce absolutely stunned uh, horrified uh, in, in terrible pain manages to scramble out of the car and start to run across the street but the gunman is behind him and shoots him two or three more times and Bruce makes it across and collapses then the gunman delivers a final shot into Bruce's head and then runs off down the street and turns a corner and disappears. Now, in your book, you have a woman named Virginia Silva, and she becomes a little bit, a very important character later. Uh, she doesn't make a phone call, but she does witness something. What does she see that evening uh, based on that? She, hears, she must have heard shots. What does she witness? Virginia lives uh, uh, just across the street from where the car was parked. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, they parked by some brush that that is actually next to an entrance to the Santa Ana Freeway, 
Uh, but Virginia lives across the street in a row of houses, and uh, at about one, a little after one in the morning, she uh, had just gone to sleep. She heard this this uh, blast outside. She jumps out of bed and runs downstairs and looks out through her bay window, and she sees the dark-clad gunman uh, chasing Bruce across the street and shooting at him. Um, and then uh, she sees the uh, the gunman disappear down the street. And uh, poor Virginia is horrified. But within just moments, uh, she sees uh, police uh, start arriving in ambulances. And so she said, well, there's no, no point in me calling 911. As, as it happened, the gunman ran uh, about two blocks uh, downhill after he turned left. And another uh, witness, another Hispanic woman, uh, saw him running along that sidewalk and uh, was suspicious. And, and she called 911 because she had also heard gunshots up the street and saw a man running. So she called 911, and the police uh, and the ambulances arrived just uh, moments afterwards. Now, what did they find at the, at the scene? Uh, again, they they make assessments very early on, based on their their vast experience with these kinds of cases. What did they see, and what did they initially think was unusual for? Uh, and, and what did they think this crime was? And and when they what happened when they talked to Rebecca about this as well? Well. Uh, the, the first witness uh, who saw it from her bay window uh, spotted uh, Bruce uh, lying face down in a driveway uh, with blood pouring. She couldn't see the blood, but blood was pouring out of him. And she also spotted a, a female figure uh, behind the uh, behind the SUV, uh, also uh, prostate on the uh, pavement. And uh, it looked like two people had been shot to death. Uh, the police arrive. And uh, <clears throat> as, just as they arrive, uh, Rebecca rises up from her uh, spot on the pavement where she'd been lying down, oddly with her ha- head cupped in her hands <laughs> and her shoes mm-hmm. placed very neatly behind the wheel as if she'd placed them in a closet. And wow. she gets up and says, oh, oh, my God, we were, they were carjackers. They, uh, oh, and they hit me and hit me on my head and knocked me out. And what happened? Oh, I don't know. And they took my rings. They took my expensive rings. Oh, and she's just had, carrying on having a fit. And uh, the police, uh, the, the paramedics examine Bruce and find that he's, he's beyond any help. Then they examine Rebecca. And uh, they find no scratches, no bumps, no indication of being slugged, even though she's complaining she was knocked out by these carjackers. Uh, the police arrive and detectives arrive, and they wonder why carjackers would uh, shoot this man and leave that car, that brand new car, sitting there uh, running with the engine running, and yeah. her purse sitting in the <laughs> in the middle yeah. of the seat. Uh, wh- carjackers don't do that, uh, but they don't have any real evidence that she's lying, so uh, uh, they they pretty much accept her story and, and start investigation. And then they right. talk to the witness down the, the uh, street who also uh, speaks of, uh, of seeing the dark-clad men running down the street. And she, she thought she heard a car door slam and a, and a car drive away uh, a few feet away from her house. Right. Now, we don't have that much time. We've got 11 minutes. So what I'm going to do is that um, I want to talk about, go backwards a little bit to uh, another important figure, which is a, a LAPD officer named Robert, this is a pseudonym you, you use for him, but Robert Zavala, or Zavala, and that there was some relationship with uh, Alvaro, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about his relationship to this story, and, well, because it's very important right after this turn of events here. Well, the cousin, Alvaro, had uh, been working at the YMCA in Boyle Heights uh, in East L.A., and uh, in doing that, uh, he met an, a police officer who came in once in a while. Uh, uh, we call him Zavala in the uh, story. And, uh, and he actually, he actually uh, asked if he could uh, get some information about uh, becoming a policeman. Alvaro wanted to become a policeman. Right. Uh, and then uh, they, they all, uh, after Bruce was kicked out of the house, they all took that SUV and pulled the boat over to uh, Lake Havasu, including the police officer, Alvaro, Rebecca, and a couple other people went over to uh, have a few days at, at the lake. Uh, now, uh, she's, she's kind of hinting that she'd like to have an affair with this police officer, while she's also talking about uh, maybe see, then her next target would be one of the the greatest boxers in Southern California history. I won't even name him right now because. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, she she has her, her she's targeting new men already uh, before before the murder. Um, 
And then uh, Zavala gets a strange call uh, early in the morning and wakes him up after 1 o'clock on the, mo- on the morning of the murder, and it's Alvaro. And uh, he first, at one call, he says, oh, I'm over here and I'm all distraught because of my girlfriend's breaking up with me. Uh, well, why are you calling me? Well, I just need someone to talk to. And then uh, a little while later he calls, oh, my God, I just heard that uh, Bruce was shot. Bruce was shot and killed. Now Zavala is really uh, wondering what's going on. So sure. he he goes in and tells the uh, detective who's assigned this case about all this, and this begins to open things up. Mm-hmm. Now, do you want me to proceed with you? Know, we're getting close, out short of time. You want me to step uh, one step forward and tell? Yeah, go happen? ahead. Just just continue to uh, yeah continue with the story. Okay. Well, uh, we we've talked about Beth Lamb, the Mormon uh, the Mormon mom wedding photographer. Uh, right. Now now. Uh, Rebecca is supposed to be grieving over her dead husband, but she calls Beth and says, oh, we need a lot of whole bunch of pictures for the funeral, and we need a videotape. Oh, my goodness. And so Beth goes up and makes an appointment uh, to uh, talk about uh, which pictures uh, she wants from the wedding and what to do now. And uh, Beth uh, spots uh, these beautiful rings on uh, Rebecca's hands. And uh, then she hears later, when, when she's uh, in question, she hears that, uh, that the rings were stolen when, <laughs> when the carjacker hit them. And right. she, my God, she thinks, this is, wait a minute, this woman is lying. She had those rings on her hand. And she, she struggles for several days, a couple of days, what am I going to do? And she calls a, a, a police officer friend of hers, and he said, you call that detective right now, and you tell him. So she did. And this turned. This turned. This is actually the turning point in the whole case. The Mormon mom wedding photographer's information uh, helps get this case uh, opened up and, and right. solved. They. What do the police ask Elizabeth Lamb to do? Uh, they, they ask her if she'd wear a wire and go to the house and see if she could get Rebecca to talk. And, and Elizabeth was scared to death. She just didn't. She didn't want to, but she did. She was very courageous, and well, she tried. But no, 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 no interesting information developed out of that. But because the uh, uh, the rings were obvious, uh, the uh, the officers asked her, "Could you go up there and the, and make sure she's there because we're going to do a raid." And uh, Elizabeth helps him, she, but she chooses not to be in the house when the uh, search warrant arrives. And they, they go into the house and to search and see what they can find uh, when they have a search warrant. And uh, uh, Rebecca's sitting on her hands. Uh, Rebecca, could, could we see your hands, please? And she very shyly and reluctantly holds out her hands, and there, though, that beautiful glowing diamond ring that had been stolen. Okay, now she's lying. And so... With a little bit more information beyond that, she is arrested. And by this time, they have also began uh, a, a, a unique, a brand new uh, forensic study, and that's the use of cell phones. A lot of people don't realize that cell phones can uh, put, t- tell what your location was, and those records of your calls and the calls you received are on record somewhere at sure. any given date that you use your cell phone, you can be traced within a few hundred yards where you were. Well, as it turns out, uh, Alvaro was uh, very, very close to the murder scene when it happened. And uh, the cell phone records also connected those uh, strange uh, calls that uh, Rebecca was making from the restaurant to Alvaro. And she and Alvaro exchanged dozens of calls just leading up to and right after the murder. So basically, police didn't... uh... I mean, not to say they didn't have a hard job, but it was fairly easy based on the interviews with her friends, those phone records, like you say, they they, were able to pinpoint uh, that Alvaro had made the call very close. They also, for our audience that doesn't know it, it's pretty simple why they wanted to have a police officer. They wanted to know if they could get any information about the investigation. They wanted to have an ally, they they figured, uh, in the police force. didn't really work out that way. Um, Not the smartest of criminals, so... Anyway, we'll just leave it at that because it's a, the trial, the story has more twists and turns, and it's an incredible trial itself, too. So, well, The final twist was that the, the witness down the street who saw the dark-clad figure running was able to identify Jose, the other, uh, Alvaro's brother, as the shooter. And so right. that, the, that witness identification pinned him, and uh, yeah. they all went to trial, and uh, it took three trials to settle this case, finally. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, you'll have to. We'll have to leave it for our audience to want to read this book, and uh, because it looks like a, it looks looks like an incredible slam dunk at the beginning of the trial, but not so. Not with three trials, that's for sure. 
Well, I was hoping we'd leave some mystery for the readers. To have the <laughs> Absolutely. <of> that book. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's a great book, uh, Don. I also wanted to uh, talk about uh, some, one of the new projects you're working on right now, and I wanted to tell people how many books have you written so far in your, you said, 15-year uh, career so far. How many books have you written? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I, uh, I, th- this book was number 18. I've just finished number wow. 19, and I just, just in August I went to the trial for the one I'm beginning to work on right now, which will be number 20. All of these but one were true crime books. Wow. What is the, the new case you're working on? Can you tell us about that, or who, who it's involved in? Yeah, this is a case of a, of a New York lawyer who moved to Hollywood and uh, wanted to immerse himself in the lifestyle, and he did, in the pornography, drugs, strippers, and, uh, and wound up uh, killing a young woman with him. He became involved here by, with a little clumsy game of uh, Russian roulette. Wow. Dumped her body out in the desert. Do you have a, a working title for, the, for this book? Well, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're calling it, the, the one I just finished, it, 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 we just titled it Deadly Deceit. That's about a man who murdered his own parents in uh, Arizona and used wow. their money to take his 15-year-old girlfriend to Hawaii. Oh, the one incredible. On, the one I'm starting to work on right now is called Homicide in the Hollywood Hills. Wow, great title. Uh, so Deadly Deceit, when did that come out? It will come out. I just finished it. Oh, pardon and, uh, me. Sorry. It's in the process of publication now. It will probably come out a little bit later this year or early next year. Is that another title with Kensington? That Yeah, it is with Kensington, and that's uh-huh. Deadly Deceit. Uh, Deadly Deceit. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, um, and and so what made you start to write true crime? I know maybe I don't know if we'd actually talked about it on the show last time when we did uh, Die For Me, but what made you, what compelled you to become involved with this true crime genre? Well, I, that's what I read, and, and I, I had a 30-year career with the phone company and spent uh, five years after that uh, just traveling the world, and I said, oh, i got some time. I, got, I should be doing something else, and so I said, I'll write a book. Well, I'd always read true crime books, and uh, and I'd always had a deadly horror of being locked up. I'm a little claustrophobic, and being locked, locked up uh, it just gives me the shivers, so I read several books about people in life in prison, and so when I decided, what shall I do next? I think I'll write a true crime book. <laughs> and so that's what got that started. It's been a great second career, I'll tell you. It's great, great fun. I've been Absolutely. Like- Absolutely. Um, and when, at what point did you take a foray into fiction? Uh, I've not written any fiction. These are all nonfiction books. Every book of mine, and, and including the other one, which is not uh, which is not true crime, that was about World War II men shot down in France and rescued through the French underground. And what was the name of that book? That's called their, their Deeds of Valor, and that one comes from my heart. I love doing that one because I got to go interview scores of men who actually flew those B-17s and, and, and uh, P-51s and, and were, were shot down or crash-landed in France. Wow, so that was I, went really... to, I went to France as well and interviewed some of the, uh, the French underground people, which was great fun. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And... Um... You say you decided you'd really always read true crime. What are the some of, what are some of the authors that uh, were influences for you? It's interesting. Uh, of course, uh, Truman Capote uh, was uh, and his in Cold Blood was the, sure. uh, he's the pioneer. And then the second one was Onion Field by Joe Wamba. And mm-hmm. right now, I just finished reading Wamba's. I think it's about his 18th or 20th book, and it ties in so nicely with de- with my homicide in the Hollywood Hills. He even mentions a detective whom I interviewed uh, a few weeks ago, and is uh, is acknowledged in his book. So it's going to tie in wonderfully with Wamba's works, who who was one of my uh, uh, idols when I began writing. Wow. It's also interesting as well because I interviewed Philip Carlo, another pinnacle author, Kensington author. About the Night Stalker and yeah. and uh, Bertha's family uh, was involved with the capture of Richard Ramirez in that neighborhood when he was running from the law. That's right. So, I was amazed when I interviewed her, and she told me that her friends were the, those uh, Hispanic people who chased Ramirez down and and captured him. It was just incredible too that story where where Ramirez comes back into Los Angeles and his face is all over the newspapers and the. Uh, the Hispanic people are saying El Matador, El Matador, as he's running away, saying the killer, the killer. You know, so. yeah, right. Yeah, incredible. Ron yeah. and I actually retraced his the route he ran that day and stopped at that little store where he saw the newspaper with his picture on the front, and then I have my picture taken at that same newsstand. Wow, incredible, incredible. Yeah, well, I just really want to thank you very much, Don, for coming back on the program and uh, with this 
uh, second book that we've talked about. I guess we'll have to talk about a lot more than that. With uh, you're on your twentieth right now, so I want to thank you very much for coming on and talking about your great book, Honeymoon with a Killer. Uh, great story, and uh, thank you very much for the interview, Don. My pleasure, Dan. Thanks so much. I'll be looking forward to talking to you on the next one. Okay, Don, have yourself a good evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. You've been listening to the program True Murder, the most shocking killers in true crime history, and the authors that have written about them, with my special guest, Don Lassiter, with Ronald E. Bowers. That's Honeymoon with a Killer on Kensington. Pinnacle is the true crime imprint. Have yourself a good evening. Good night. I tried to write about Rebecca Salcedo and this case specifically. Well, it's kind of an interesting cultural story to that that I did not include in the book. But when uh, my collaborator, my co-writer, co-author, and I, Ron Bowers and I were considering this story, I was looking at it and I was wondering, really, what sounded so familiar about it? And suddenly it hit me that it's a, re- it's a retelling of the opera Carmen, Bizet's opera. Uh-huh. Uh, in that, uh, and I, I, when I was a kid, I saw a, a, a version of that with uh, Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford. So I'm picturing Rita Hayworth as Rebecca, and in the, in Carmen, uh, this woman is a beautiful, tempestuous, fiery gypsy in Spain who's selling her wares in a in a town plaza, and she meets an innocent, inexperienced soldier, Don Jose. He falls wow. hopelessly in love, but she's unfaithful with a bullfighter. Their affair wrecks his life and ends in deadly tragedy. Rebecca meets Bruce while selling spices at a swap meet, captures his heart as unfaithful with male strippers. So yeah. and their relationship wrecks his life, which ends in deadly tragedy. So this is this is Carmen only without the magnificent music that marches at the old La Mirada Drive-In Theater, which is now a swap meet uh, in Orange County. Right. Now, we're talking about Rebecca Salcedo, and it's an incredible story, her character. Let's start with her history. Where was she raised? What kind of upbringing did she have? Tell us about Rebecca Salcedo. Rebecca is one of the most complex, multifaceted women I've ever encountered in in research. Uh, Her friends call her beautiful, fun, sexy, outrageous, generous, affectionate, uh, another saw as duplicitous, self-centered, greedy, and evil. Uh, uh, Rebecca uh, was born here in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Hispanic uh, immigrants, and her mother was uh, raped uh, and uh, produced the first daughter, Rebecca's older sister, as a result of that rape in Tijuana, and then uh, moved up here and uh, uh, was uh, that that man deserted her, and she was married again, and and that marriage didn't last forever. So Rebecca grew up in pretty much a dysfunctional family with a lot of strain on the household. She and her sisters didn't get along well. Her mother was a uh, uh, a, a nurse, uh, worked at, as a nurse, but uh, was hooked on uh, prescription drugs and spent a lot of time in her bedroom while the sisters uh, pretty much ran the house. So it wasn't a happy childhood, and I don't know if we can say use that as the abuse excuse or not, uh, as many right. criminals who say they uh, grew up in, in a poor environment. Now, one thing you haven't talked about is her, her, her okay, say so we have her upbringing, but what did she develop into? What type of character? Uh, she uh, obviously was an attractive woman. You can see that in the cover on the on the book. But what she what did she realize? If she didn't realize too many things, and what did she realize early on, and how did that affect her character development? Well, her her her, her good looks and her her incredible body uh, it became her uh, her path to uh, existence, uh, to wealth. Uh, she learned soon at the age of about twelve or thirteen, when she grew into a woman's body, that uh, men would give her just about anything she wanted if she behaved in certain ways, and she did. And she had she had no trouble at all displaying those uh, wares. But she also uh, uh, developed a, a gregarious personality that that attracted not only men but women. And I mean men and women in, in any way you want to imagine. Um, she saw. Uh, Good evening. This is your host Dan Zapansky for the program True Murder: The Most Shocking Killers in True Crime History and the authors that have written about them. Rebecca Salcedo had an easy smile, a sexy body, and strong appetites. She wanted the world. Bruce Clayland, she decided, would buy it for her. The shy engineer quickly fell victim to her charms. 
getting her whatever she wanted, a new car, a boat, a house. But he wasn't Rebecca's only admirer. Even after Rebecca manipulated Bruce into marrying her, hoping to divorce him and take him for everything he had, she occupied herself with a series of lovers, male strippers, women. They all spent time in Rebecca's bed. But when she learned that a divorce would only get her a few pennies, she knew she had to find another way to secure Bruce's fortune. Uh, the book tonight that featured is Honeymoon with a Killer. He loved her. She loved his money. Um, a return guest, uh, Don Laster, my very special guest, uh, Don Lasseter, Honeymoon with a Killer. Welcome back to the program, Don Lasseter. Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be back with you again. Thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. And uh, a great book, by the way, Honeymoon with a Killer. Um, my favorite question, I think, because I always ask it, is um, very curious, why did you decide... The Toreadors and the beautiful Habanera. <laughs> Wow, that's what, incredible. That's what got me hooked on it. <laughs> well, it's a great story. It has all those elements, for sure. Um, now, you, you mentioned Ronald E. Bowers. Uh, he's listed on the cover as Don Lasseter, the author, with Ronald E. Bowers. So right. tell us, uh, who, what is his role in the writing of this book? Ron is a 40-year veteran of the Los Angeles County uh, District Attorney's Office, and he is, he's, he's been involved in every Ma- you know, in prosecution of every major crime in that 40 years, including right. all the ones you've heard about over the years. And so Ron has just a wealth of experience. So we became acquainted several years ago, and Ron just pretty much helps me with the research. He writes some of the things, too, as well. <clears throat> One book we, uh, uh, we quoted quite a bit of his writing. Uh, we didn't do that in Honeymoon. Uh, because I wanted to take a little different type of voice on this one. But Ron right. is just a wealth of information for me. Great, great. Now, uh, for our audience, where does this story primarily take place, and in what era, what what time are we talking about, what years? It, it took place in the, uh, in the um, actually, in the mid-80s, mid um, and uh, it, it, right here in Southern California. She, she, uh, Rebecca met Bruce.